Good evening, everyone. I will go ahead and say a few words so that you can check out your uh, speakers and make sure that you can hear us okay. We will start at 510. So uh, we look forward to hearing more in a few minutes. I hope people had a chance to get out earlier today and then enjoy this uh, incredibly warm weather for the first week of November. I went out for a walk earlier today and had to shoo flies away from my face. <laughs> November. <laughs> you can check out your your mic uh, or your speakers and make sure that you can hear. Um, we will be using the chat box to answer questions or to ask questions uh, as we go along. So uh, you can find that usually at the bottom of the screen if you're used to Zoom by now, which I think most of us have had an opportunity to use Zoom at one point or another in the past six months. So, All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started and, and I'll watch to make sure if we've got more that want to join us, but uh, this session is being recorded. So if you uh, are trying to take notes or something and and don't get everything down you can always come back and watch the recording later and i imagine we'll have some that weren't able to make it uh, during this hour who will come back and watch it too so uh, again uh, you're I'm Rhoda Burroughs. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Rhoda Burroughs. I'm a horticulture extension specialist uh, with SDSU. I'm based out of Rapid City. I work with fruit and vegetable growers across the state, and you're always welcome to contact me if there's something that I can help you out with. Uh, tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Raymond Cloyd from Kansas State University. Dr. Cloyd is an extension entomologist at KSU, which is in Manhattan. His work involves pest management in both home and commercial settings. He studies pest management and plant protection, including biological control, plant insect in interactions, and non-chemical means of dealing with insect and mite pests. He's written an excellent book on greenhouse pest management, which you might have come across, uh, to aid growers in managing pests safely and effectively. A sampling of some of his articles I looked at earlier today were, were topics as diverse as controlling pests of hemp. And maybe when our industry in South Dakota gets going, we'll be in contact about that. Uh, why bio, biological control fails, how you can stop aphids by understanding their interactions with plants. And one which I imagine gets a lot of attention a, a few years back, he wrote an article on secrets of the big bugs, special effects in the 1950s science fiction movies. Uh, so you might wanna check that one out. Tonight, he will present to us plant protection of insect and mite pests in vegetable and fruit crops. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cloyd. Thank you. We'll share my screen. Rada, can I share my screen now? You should be able to. Uh, it says host disabled screen. John, can you? Hi, Rada. <laughs> so, okay, there, okay. There, okay, got it. Okay. Okay, so thanks. Um, so, uh, can you all hear me? There we are. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank, well, first of all, um, uh, I don't have a camera on mine, besides, you wouldn't want to look at my mug anyway, but uh, this is your speaker, and that is Venice. 
it's on a backdrop. I was there uh, many years ago, uh, but that's what I look like uh, today as I did back then many years ago. Um, so <clears throat> let me hold on for a minute. Let me, okay, so let's get these, aha, there it is. Got it now. Okay, <clears throat> so there I am. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that stuff. So, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Kathleen and uh, Rod and everybody for inviting me to speak to you uh, down in Kansas. <clears throat> uh, the topic of discussion is called plant protection of insect and mite pests in vegetable and fruit crops. Uh, that's a large component of my responsibilities, which also includes greenhouse, nursery, landscape, turf grass, uh, Christmas trees, pollinators, hemp, and uh, many others. Uh, so here we go. Uh, what you can expect this evening during the presentation, I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Uh, we talk about the insect and mite pests of vegetable and fruit crops. Now, not all of these are uh, problematic in the Midwest, Kansas, and South Dakota, but I think it's good to know uh, what is out there uh, on, on, a, on a wide basis. And then I'm going to talk about some management strategies, talking about scouting, trap crops, protective barriers, and pesticides, and of course, in this case, insecticides and miticides, and at the end, uh, or during well, questions and discussion. So let's first go over the common insect and mite pests of vegetable crops. Uh, I break them down into three categories. The first are the chewers, that's the caterpillars, imported cabbage worm, corn earworm, cor cutworms, hornworms, and cabbage looper. Uh, the beetles, Colorado potato beetle, spotted cucumber beetle, flea beetles, striped cucumber beetle, bean leaf beetle, and blister beetles, and then grasshoppers. Uh, the sucking insects, those that are feeding in the vascular tissues and, these, and also the chlorophyll, uh, aphids, spider mites, squash bug, leaf hoppers, and stink bugs. And then those that actually are boring into the tissues includes squash vine borer and then the European corn borer. So a multitude of not, not uh, all those are major problems depending on what you're growing, but that gives you kind of a, a breath of what the potential pest could be. Now we switch to fruit crops. And again, I break it down into three sections. The chewers, that includes caterpillars, coddling moth, oriental fruit moth, red banded leaf folder, and obligate banded leaf roller, fly larva, we have the apple maggot and our infamous spotted wing drosophila, and then the beetles include plum coquilio and Japanese beetle. Uh, the suckers, we have a series of aphids, one of the major ones is woolly apple aphid, primarily in apple trees, and then spider mites, European red mite and two-spotted spider mite, uh, European red mite, uh, primarily in apples, leaf hoppers, stink bugs, and of course, uh, everybody's concerned about the invasive species called the brown marmoray stink bug. Um, I don't know if you have it in South Dakota, but we have it in Kansas. Uh, it's in our eastern regions, and it's very problematic because the larva and the, the nymphs and the adults feed, and then they go into people's homes, and they become a nuisance pest. Uh, it's very similar to the Asian ladybird beetle. A uh, series of scales, one of our major ones we deal with on apple trees is the San Jose scale. Uh, there are others, but the main one on apples, pears, plums, peaches, and nectarines is the, the San Jose scale. Plant bugs, we have our infamous ligus, or also known as the tarnished plant bug, image right there on the right. And then we have those ones that uh, the borers, and the, the main ones are the greater peach tree borer and the lesser peach tree borer. Uh, those are primarily attacking uh, peaches and nectarines. So this kind of gives you a composite. Uh, they're not all in the Midwest, uh, but we have a, a fair, fair share of our series of, of pests on vegetables and fruit crops. So I just thought I'd show you uh, several of these you may be familiar with. Uh, these are not life-size or close-ups, and I do have to make a disclaimer. Uh, the reason uh, there are several pictures of insects having sex is they're really easy to take pictures of. This is not pornography, but when they're having sex, they don't move very fast. And you can get really quality images. So I just want to put that disclaimer in there. So the striped on the left and the spotted cucumber beetle feed on cucurbits, you know, zucchini, squash, watermelon, uh, the whole gamut. But one of the, the other problems with them is a vector bacterial wilted cucumber. And that is a bacteria that once it's inside the plant, uh, it causes collapse and the plants basically die out. So one of the things you need to remember with a number of these insect and mite pests, insects in particular, is not only their direct feeding damage, but also their ability to vector a number of serious diseases to both vegetables and fruit crops. So the other one we deal with quite a bit is aphids, and aphids are also vectors of, of viruses, primarily zucchini, squash, cucumber, uh, cantaloupe, not so much watermelon, but you know, aphids is another of those sucking insects I mentioned earlier, and they also 
in addition to the direct feeding damage, they can also vector uh, viruses. In fact, aphids uh, are, are the major virus vector out there feeding on, on vegetable crops and, as well as leafhoppers. So two-spotted spider mites are not my, uh, insects, they are mites, uh, but they feed in a wide diversity of vegetable crops. We have problems with watermelon and uh, fr uh, fruit trees. The two-spotted spider mite is a major pest on cucurbits, primarily watermelon in our region. And uh, there, is, there right there is the male, the female, and these little round objects are their eggs. Typically, you'll see the, the webbing on leaf underside around the mid vein. And I need to tell you right away, because it's very important, most of the insects and mite pests we deal with are on the leaf underside. And the reason for that is they do not like direct sunlight because of their size, and they're very susceptible to desiccation. So when we talk about insecticides and miticides, it's critical to get on leaf undersides because that's where these insects and mite pests are residing. So another one we deal with is a stink bug, uh, primarily on tomatoes, but we will get them on, I deal with the grape growers, so we, we have uh, them feeding on grapes also. Uh, so you can see a white, white this is just a, a, a little gallery of what's out there feeding on our various vegetables and tomato uh, and crops. But the bit, one of the major ones, major ones is squash bug. Uh, the eggs are laid on the leaf underside, they're distinctly red, and then they go through five nymphal end stars uh, the gray ones are about the fourth or fifth end star, and then they, be, of course, become adults. And uh, they feed on most of the cucurbit crops. I think watermelon is less susceptible. But the problem is the, leaf, the everything is on the leaf underside. And so that makes it hard to get at them with, uh, with spray applications. We have people that uh, vacuum up the nymphs, uh, squish uh, the eggs. Some people uh, will use horticultural oils. Horticultural oils are effective on the eggs. It suffocates them. They can't breathe, uh, but you have to do that. You have to do that throughout the year because, well, here in Kansas, we have two generations. You more likely have one, but still, um, the female is pretty prolific. It can lay these clusters of eggs, several clusters of eggs, on leaf undersides of plants in the cucurbitaceae group. So, really, where do these insects and mite pests feed? Well, I broke it down into three uh, sections of the plant. The leaves. We have the two-spotted spider mite aphids, leafhoppers, cucumber beetles, squash bug, and caterpillars. Uh, those that feed on the stem include the European corn borer, aphids, grasshoppers, and, and scales, primarily fruit trees. And then the fruit and the flowers, uh, a real problem, problematic pest, I understand, in South Dakota, and it's a problem here, is the corn earworm, stink bugs, ligus bug, also called the tarnished plant bug, spotted wing drosophila, uh, you're familiar with that, getting into fruit very early on in the season, and then the cucumber beetles, both the striped, uh, striped primarily more so than the spotted, will feed on uh, the rind and fruits of the cucurbits. So here's an example of everybody's probably favorite insect. This is the corn earworm. Um, once it gets into the tassel area, it's pretty uh, tolerant of any sprays, and that means you got to get the sprays out there earlier. Uh, Dipel or the Bacillus thuringiensis Kirastaki product does not work too good on corn earworm because they tend to tunnel in. Uh, spinosad is one of our commonly recommended. It's sold as conserve, tracer, uh, some success is another trade name. Um, but here's a really, a really common pest we deal with in the Midwest. Um, we, another caterpillar, this is the imported cabbage worm. We deal with the cabbage looper. Uh, we deal with the diamondback moth. And these can be very devastating. The female, of course, has the, the, the two white spots. The male only has the one. Um, but these can be very problematic on bro uh, broccoli, collards, anything in the, the uh, brassicaceae family, and requires some type of intervention to avoid substantial damage and probably uh, uh, yield losses. Here, here's an example of a cucumber beetle, again, feeding. This one feeds in the flowers. Uh, after the pollen, but again, this is a case where uh, they damage the flower too much that the, uh, the plant doesn't produce a pumpkin. So again, knowing where they feed like leaves, stems, and flowers is important where you're going to target your uh, means of alleviating problems with many of these insects and mite pests of vegetables and also fruits. Okay, so what's really also important is to know when insect and mite pests are active during the growing season. And this will be called the seasonality of pest problems. So insect and mite pests, because they're cold-blooded, are going to respond to te warmer temperatures. The warmer the temperature, you get a buildup of degree day units, and that's related to development. 
and that's when they start moving from one stage to the next. That is primarily influenced by temperature, but also plant availability. Um, so when we have warm springs, uh, that we have a higher degree day accumulation. The infestations occur earlier than if we have cool springs or, or wet springs. Uh, and if we have cool summertime, that also delays development. So if you track population trends, or we call population dynamics throughout the year, uh, you'll see they vary depending primarily on the temperature and also on the plant availability. So some of the management strategies that, uh, that are out there, and I'm not going to cover all these in detail, uh, but scouting, no doubt, is, is critical. Uh, if you're not scouting, you're kind of going down the road with blinders on. You really don't know what's happening from the standpoint of population dynamics. And what population dynamics means is uh, the numbers of insects at a given point in time, okay? And then we have our culture practices, uh, physical removal. Um, sometimes that may work depending on the size of the operation. Uh, sanitation, I'll, I'll come back to that, especially for the overwintering stages. Uh, planting time, uh, trap cropping, and then pesticides, just some, some helpful hints there. And biological control, and I will talk about a very successful program we've done in uh, hoop house tomatoes in the, over the last six years. So I, I, what I call the aggressive scouting program, um, this is in tomato production, uh, hoop house for outdoors, and we call the beat method, where you put a white piece of paper on a paper cl uh, clipboard, and you shake the branches, and you look for the presence of spider mites, thrips, whatever insects are going to be problematic on the crop. Um, how often you do this uh, depends on the time of year and uh, previous history of infestations. Uh, but again, you're not counting the insects so much. You're kind of getting what we call a presence absence assessment of what's going on. So what I recommend is in order to see some of the smaller arthropods, arthropods referring to insects and mites, is using a 10 or 16x, 16x hand lens. Uh, I carry these in one of my pockets. It's kind of like American Express. Don't go anywhere without it. And that allows you to see uh, some of the smaller, uh, particularly the mites. Uh, that could land on a, the white, or some people use a black piece of paper for some of the, the lighter colored insect or mite pest. Okay, so in fruit, in fruit tree production, uh, one of the means of, of scouting is using pheromone traps. Uh, this is an operation uh, I deal with, uh, apples, uh, using these Tracy traps. Uh, you can get them from uh, Great Lakes, IPM. And what they do is for us, we use them for monitoring for codling moth and apple, apple mag. Now, uh, one, fer one pheromone is for codling moth, the other is for apple mag in adults. Well, how these work? Well, you put them out, and inside there is an attractant. This is for the female. Uh, and this little uh, septa is a lure that has a pheromone for the male. And these are extremely helpful for timing at, uh, insecticide applications because you'll pick up males first. In the insect world, the males only uh, always emerge first before the females because they're going to come out in, and then wait for females and mate with them. So um, this is what we use. Now, what you'll capture will vary depending on what this lure is. And so in this image, uh, this is a familiar one, calling moth. This is the calling moth male. On the upper right is the lure, uh, the attractant and the lure, but this helps us time our insecticide applications. We know when we see the males, about seven days after we should be spraying because those females are going to be laying eggs and those eggs are going to close or the larvae are going to merge and then tunnel right directly into the apple fruit. And once they're in the apple fruit, it's uh, that's it. Um, and when somebody takes a bite of an apple and there's a half a worm in there, it's not a pleasant experience. So again, these are helping you time your applications accordingly as opposed, as opposed to guessing. So here's another example. Uh, another pest we deal with is the greater peach tree borer. And these are the males. Uh, the females are, are very light colored near the end. But again, here is the rubber septa that emits the, uh, a, the volatile uh, pheromone that then attracts uh, these males. And that, and that tells us that uh, in about five to seven days, we need to spray the base of the peaches or nectarines uh, for a greater peach tree, because that's where they lay their eggs. The greater peach tree borer lays a uh, female lays her eggs near the base of the tree, where the lesser peach tree borer, which we have a pheromone, lays it uh, in the middle of the tree. So there, there is a dis distinct difference between the two. 
Okay, now another means of, of, of detection or monitoring are light traps. And this is what we use for detecting adult populations, in this case, the European corn borer, uh, the male on the right, the female on the left. Uh, and these are uh, basically light, light is emitted in many insects are attracted to different wavelengths of light. The, the, the moths fall, hit it, they fall in into a uh, container, and then you, ch you check that regularly, and that tells you when the males are active. And again, uh, that helps you time your applications of your insecticides. Okay, so another trap that we use for spotted wing drosophila, which I understand you're dealing with in South Dakota, is the spotted wing drosophila trap. And this is the one from Century. Uh, we actually, we make our own, but this is one we've been using uh, in raspberry production. Uh, we use it uh, in blackberry, uh, raspberry, um, and uh, in apples, and it's because spotted wing drosophila has a wide host range. But what's in here is a vinegar apple cider based uh, odor that attracts the primarily the males. They come in and they get they get uh, caught down here, and then you, if you get when you identify them, you know when they're when they're active. Remember, spotted wing drosophila is unlike other fruit flies; it attacks unmature fruit, and that is unlike others that rely on fermentation to lure. So the spotted wing drosophila females lay their eggs on raspberries and fruits even before they color. And, and so if you don't get the materials on there before that, then the eggs are laid and then the larvae are get inside uh, the fruits. And at that point, it's really too late. So the spotted wing drosophila on the left is a female and the females are easy to detect. They have a serrated overpositor. There is right there, it's like a saw that allows a female to insert, uh, go through thick and thin skin fruits and then lay her eggs. The males have a distinct black uh, spotting on their forewings, and that's how we to tell the difference. Tell the difference between the two. The males going back are more prevalent in these traps than the females are. So another means of monitoring uh, for stink bugs, which we use, is pheromone traps, and these are placed in the orchard. And this is for the stink bugs. They will do is they'll they'll hit this baffle. They'll crawl up. Uh, there's a lure right there's a picture on the right of again that's that rubber septa that emits a lure that attracts in some cases uh, uh, the, the males predominantly they get in here and they can't get out and there is a trap for the brown marmory stink bug uh, that looks it looks very similar to this one right here but we also get green and brown stink bugs uh, feeding on uh, many fruits in this in, or, in this orchard it was uh, peaches and nectarines well, another means of, it's not quite like monitoring, uh, it's called mating disruption. And what it is, is these are rubber, uh, like actually they're made of rubber pretty much or a facsimile, and they're embedded with a pheromone. And the pheromone is released at high volumes and this prevents the males from mating with the females. And these are just two, three examples of the use of that in operations here in Kansas, primarily in apples, you use this for coddling moth, you can use it for apple maggot and, and some of the other ones. And this prevents the females and males from mating. Consequently, the females don't lay eggs and you, you don't get the, the larva that will then, or caterpillars that tunnel into the apple fruit. So, um, that, but I need to make a, a disclaimer. If you have less than five acres these don't work very well. You have to have over five to 10 acres for these to be very effective. So um, in a small orchard, uh, mating disruption does not work very well. It's better for, for bigger operations, better acreages. Okay, so now we move on to weeds. Um, and again, this is a strategy. Uh, I know I'm a practical person, doesn't always work, but I think it's important to uh, reinforce the importance of some of these strategies. So avoid or minimize the presence of weeds in vegetable or fruit production systems. And, and why is that? Okay. Well, the answer is that removing or minimizing the presence of weeds in or around vegetable and fruit production system because weeds can host insect pests, aphids, spider mites, uh, leaf hoppers, uh, again, many insects that feed on vegetable and fruit crops. In addition to that, they harbor the viruses 
that are vectored by these insect pests, okay? So not only do the weeds have a, a refugia or source for the insect and mite pest, but also they harbor the viruses that they can transmit. So many broadleaf weeds are susceptible to and serve as a refuge for insect and mites, such as aphids and white flies. And also weeds may serve as an overwintering sites. Two-spotted spider mites actually overwinter on weeds and residues of weeds in, in, in uh, fruit and, and vegetable crop production systems uh, during the winter time. So here's an example. This is a pigweed, amaranth, and this is leaf miner on, on the leaf. And again, this just showcases that these weeds uh, are very susceptible and serve as a reservoir for, for many insect and mite pests. Here's an example of, of a weed. It's not what you think. It's, it's not hemp. It looks like it, but it's not. Uh, these are aphids. And of course, you know, aphids are a really good example of spontaneous generation. Uh, they produce tremendous amounts of offspring. So again, not only would this harbor the, the aphids, but it might also serve as a refuge or reservoir for the viruses that the aphids could transmit to vegetable crops. For example, cucurbits or any of the crops are susceptible to the viruses that are transmitted by aphids. And I will interject some papers because I'm a scientist and uh, uh, science is still uh, at the moment, still widely respected. But this is a great paper by James Doofus, uh, 1971. He was a researcher from my, my near my home city of Salinas, California. And it's about weeds and their incident virus diseases. So uh, if you are having trouble sleeping, uh, this is a great publication to read. I He was a sugar beet uh, in, person. Uh, that's when California used to produce sugar beets. They don't as much anymore. But it's really good information about the relationship between weeds and uh, the viruses they harbor and the insects that vector them. Okay, trap crops, trap plants. There's a lot of information out there. Some of it's true, some of it's misinformation. But let me explain what trap crop, crops are. In this system we have here, we have sunflowers uh, surrounding a field, uh, it, it could be peppers or whatever, uh, plants. And what the trap crops serve is they lure the major insect pests there and prevent them from moving on to the main crop. Now, the caveat here is that the trap plant has to be more attractive than the main crop. And then also you plant the trap crop before you put the main crop in. So when you lure these insects, they're feeding and then you have to go in and either spray them or remove them. And, and the benefit of spraying is you can use anything you want that's registered because some of the materials might not be registered for the use on the main crop. Okay, so this is what, this is the, the, the theory behind what trap cropping is. And here's a, a really good example of using blue Hubbard squash. This is for minimizing problems with striped and spotty cucumber beetle. The blue Hubbard squash is very attractive to both the striped and spotted cucumber beetle adults. And they will feed on this before they move on to your cash crops. But again, you need to kill the pests on them because if the blue Hubbard squash is fed upon to the point it's not quality, they move on to the main crop. So it's not that you put these trap crops out there and you leave them, you really have to, you really have to pay attention to what's going on. So, there are articles, here's one I recommend called Trap Crops, Intercropping and Companion Planting. Uh, sometimes those are interchangeable, but you can see uh, they do talk more about uh, trap cropping. Uh, here's another article I recommend, it's called Intercropping and Pest Management. Uh, one of the things they highlight is this, the misconception persists that crop diversity in itself reduces pest damage. The key to managing pests through polyculture may lie in the specifics of orthopod behavior and orthopod plant relations. What that means is, and I just finished writing a paper uh, that published recently, that plant diversity doesn't guarantee natural enemies that will prevent plant damage, okay? So crop diversity is key, there's no doubt. And you, you wanna use natural enemies that are there, but that doesn't always translate to reducing plant damage, okay? So this is what this article gets into, and I, I think it's a really good read to give you an understanding about the, the value, the benefits, and the disadvantages of intercropping. 
So another one is companion planting. And, and there's a lot of confusion in literature right now. Uh, companion planting initially was you put two plants together and one benefits the other in terms of plant growth. But then people talked about, well, uh, marigolds will keep artichokes from getting aphids or, or the artichoke plume moth, okay? However, there's very little scientific data back that up. There are several books out there. I have them on my shelf. Let me see, yeah. Carrots love tomato and roses love garlic. And again, there's very little scientific basis for that overall. So I just wanna, wanna point that out. So companion, and, and when you read this paper, um, one of the troubles I had is they talk more about trap cropping more so than they call companion planting. So there, there is some, uh, if you download this, you can online, uh, be, be aware that they're talking more about trap cropping more than companion planting. So another means of dealing with insect pests, and we, we have a, uh, one grower in Kansas that does this, is we call these aluminum coated reflective coverings called mulch. And you can get, uh, this is a combination one of silver and black. You can also get silver by itself. And what happens here is that the sunlight reflection off the aluminum covering confuses the insects and they don't land in the plants. And, and that is great because those that transmit viruses don't land in the plant and then consequently can transmit a virus. Here's an example of an operation um, I deal with. This is peppers, and they're using, uh, again, the silver and the black here. And using reflective mulches can reduce the incidence of aphid and thrift populations. That, that, that doesn't mean they're not there, but they can't find the plants and land on them and then transmit the viruses. And that's, that's what the benefit is. So I'm a scientist. This is what the science says. And here is a paper of Western Australia showing the use of reflective mulches can reduce the incidence of watermelon mosaic virus, which is one of those transmitted by uh, aphids uh, in Western Australia. Here's another one called mulches reduce aphid-borne viruses and white flies on cantaloupe. Okay, again, it's, it's, they, they, can't, they can't hone in on the plant uh, color, whatever they're using as an olfactory response. And subsequently they either go somewhere else or they die out. And then here's another one on reflective mulches foiling insects. And again, from my home state of California originally, uh, they're using those silver reflective mulches. And again, they're using it in outdoor production systems. So again, it, 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 it's another option. When we talk about plant protection, that's the term I use. I don't use integrated pest management because we've overused it. I think plant protection means we protect our plants from harmful organisms. So it pertains to diseases, in weeds, and that's really what we're doing. So we use a combination of strategies to, to deal with our insect pests of vegetables and fruit crops. Okay, so floating row covers um, are also popular. This is one of our operations. And let me explain what these are. These are a remay fabric. They allow sunlight to come in and rain, and then you need to tuck the edges in. And the one thing you do have to do is you got to take them off in the afternoon. And the reason for that is to allow the bees to pollinate the crop if you're using indeterminate or, or determinate varieties. You got to make, now what do these do? Well, what they do is prevent spotted cucumber beetle adults from coming in and thus feeding and also reducing viral, uh, the bacterial transmission. And they also prevent the moths of imported cabbage worm cabbage looper and the others from laying eggs on the leaves. And that'll reduce damage from the caterpillars. You may have to make sure that the edges are tucked in and they have been very effective in some of our, our vegetable producing. Now, obviously you can't do this wide scale, but you can do it for susceptible crops. In this case, it was zucchini protecting it from spotted uh, and striped cucumber beetle. So what's the science say? Here's a publication called Floating Row Cover and Transparent Mulch to Reduce Insect Populations, Virus Damage on Cantaloupes. Um, and reading the paper, it, it shows that there was the benefit of the floating row cover. One of the problems is they didn't talk about cost, um, but they did talk that floating row cover um, prevented the insects from coming in and transmitting the virus. In this case, it was uh, white flies, leaf miners, um, on cantaloupe. 
So another strategy we use is planting early or later in the growing season. And this actually is beneficial to avoid problems with striped or spotted cucumber beetle. The striped cucumber beetle, because it overwinters as an adult near cucurbits, is, comes out first. The spotted cucumber beetle in the Midwest comes up from the, from the south and we get later on. So sometimes planting early uh, will min minimize problems with the spotted cucumber beetle or planting later will minimize problems with the striped cucumber beetle. Uh, this also works on certain leaf hoppers. The potato leaf hopper does not overwinter in the Midwest. It comes up from the south when they harvest the alfalfa. So planting early or late is another strategy to mitigate problems with certain insect pests. Another one that's out there is straw mulch. Um, and you're probably wondering, what's the benefit of straw mulch? Well, um, what I do is I go to science. And so here's a paper talking about the effects of straw mulch on insect pests, predators, and weeds. Now, straw mulch, what it does technically is it provides an environment for predators like beetles, uh, carabids that feed in the larval stage, in this case, cholera potato beetle larva. And so you're killing the larval stage and minimizing the influx of adults coming out of the soil or residue later on. So straw, uh, we have a number of organic producers that rely on straw mulch, not only for weed management, but also for stimulating, promoting, or enhancing uh, soil-borne soil -borne predators. So I thought it was important to determine what life stage do insects and mite pests overwinter? And there are four life stages that can happen. Egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Now the insect and mite pests can overwinter on plants, in the soil, and in plant debris or residues. So when we look at some of the common insect pests of vegetables primarily, adults, the Colorado potato beetle, cucumber, be cucumber beetle, squash bug, asparagus beetle, flea beetles, harlequin bug, and two-spotted spider mite, they overwinter as adults. What does that mean? It means that they come out earlier in the season because they're adults ready to go and ready to feed. So they're really early on in the season. Those that overwinter as pupa include the tomato and tobacco hornworms, imported cabbage worm, European corn borer, and squash fine borer. Okay, so the pupa is a transitional stage between the larva and adult, and this is how those insects overwinter. Eggs, of course, are grasshoppers. They lay their uh, complement of pods, eggs in the soil, and that's how they overwinter. Okay, this is great information, but what do you do with it? Well, you can use that information to deal with them in terms of either tilling in the fall, that'll expose the pupa or adults that are in the residues or plant debris to environmental conditions, especially um, Kansas and South Dakota, we do get pretty severe cold winters, uh, or for predators, birds, uh, other vertebrates that are out there looking for a food source. Also removing weeds will eliminate overwintering sites for certain insects and even spider mites. So uh, again, uh, is it always practical? No, but it can be an option, or you can think about this from an ecological standpoint when dealing with insects and mite pests. Okay, um, I know insecticides and miticides are used, but I wanna focus in on how to use them effectively. And there are three of my mantras, timing, coverage, and frequency. Timing is you want to apply your materials when the most abundant, with the most susceptible life stages are present. And in the insects and mites, it's the larva, nymphs, and adults. There is no insecticide out there or miticide that kills the pupal stage. Now, when we look at eggs, the only group of pesticides that kills the eggs are the, lar are the oils. Horticultural oils, whether they be petroleum or mineral-based, they suffocate the eggs, and I mentioned that with squash bugs, and the eggs die, okay? But that's the only material out there that really has uh, mortality on the eggs. Coverage. When you're spraying your material, you have to get thorough coverage of all plant parts, including the leaf undersides and the stems. Frequency. Where do you get that information? Off the label. And the frequency will depend on the residual activity of a given pesticide. If you have a material with a long residual activity, you don't spray as often. If you have one with a short residual activity, you have to spray as often, okay? Just, but that information is on the label. And of course you need to read the label every time you're going to apply any pesticide. 
So here's an operation I deal with. This is one of the, uh, the, the, the high volume spray applications. And a lot of times it's the operational factors that are important in maximizing the effectiveness of pesticide applications against insect and mite pests, okay? Yeah, you can have a really good insecticide and it's supposed to kill the pest, but if you don't apply it properly, you're wasting your time, okay? And, and possibly causing some ecological consequences, okay? So the key item is leaf undersides, squash bug eggs, spider mites, aphids. Almost all the insects we talk about and mites are like located on leaf undersides. So you have to get, I know that's difficult. Dealing with the watermelon grows and spider mites, it, it's really difficult, okay? Uh, but again, that's where you're gonna get your highest mortality based on adequate spray coverage. I just wanted to highlight a, a publication I think is very valuable. Although it's not related to vegetables and uh, fruit crops, it's pretty relevant. And it's called Influence of Spray Application Technique on Spray Disposition in Greenhouse Ivy Pot Plants Grown in, on Hanging Shelves. The information is still relevant in vegetables and fruits. Why? Because in general, Foliar applications to a crop are very inefficient because only a fraction of the pesticide actually is retained on the plants and is lost to the ground, okay? Aerial applications, the studies I've read, two to 5%, two to 5% of the actual material gets to where the insects are at. Most of it is gone through a drift, evaporation, or lands on the ground, okay? So what do you do? Well, one of my recommendations, and I've worked with many growers across the, the world and ever, is using water-sensitive paper to determine actual spray coverage. Well, what is this? Well, water-sensitive paper is yellow, and it's an, a measurement of how good your coverage is. If you're, after spraying, your water-sensitive paper is all blue, you are doing a fantastic job with spray coverage. If it's in this area, where it's barely blue, you're not doing a good job, okay? So what we, what we do is we place these uh, little paper, it's like one by one inch strips out into the vegetable crop or orchard. We have the producer spray, and then we come back and we look at what the, what the water sensitive paper looks like. So here's an example. On the, these two, the top rows, this is a producer that was spraying, they were about three feet from the crop and they were, I thought, moving fairly rapidly, okay? So what I did was I told them, okay, get about two feet and slow down, reduce the GPM and slow down. And what happened was a noticeable difference in the coverage. These two on the, uh, the far right, far left were on the outer edge of the crop. And these two in the middle were kind of in the center of the crop, but it was a dramatic eye-opening experience all you, all the, all the sprayer did was reduce the um, space between the plants and the sprayer, the nozzles, and slow down, and we got a substantial increase in the coverage. Okay, now for the remainder of my time, I want to talk about an operation that I've dealt with six years using biological control. And biological control is using uh, natural enemies, parasitoids and predators, to regulate pest populations, okay? Uh, that's, that's actually another topic that I, I, I would be willing to give at any time, but let's focus in on this, this operation. This is a hoop house production. They do also outside. You can see the straw mulch, but these are tomatoes, obviously. This is what spider mites can do. You can see the mites on the leaf underside, and this is the damage they'll cause on tomatoes. We call it bronzing or stippling. Uh, when you have a very heavy infestation. Again, everything is on leaf undersides. Spider mites are removing the chlorophyll, giving the plants kind of a speckling, uh, sort of a dirty looking appearance. Well, in 2014, uh, we were up there and this is the start of a spider mite infestation. It's later on the season, probably June and July. You get, and, and obviously it's getting bad. This is of course damage from the two spotted spider mite. And it was getting really bad because these are clusters of spider mite outbreaks. Now, 
being an entomologist, I have to confess, I thought this was absolutely beautiful. However, the producer did not. But really, when you look close, this is what we were seeing. And this is a lot of two-spotted spire mites on a tomato plant, OK? They did not get good coverage. The timing was not right. And so what do we want to do? Let's release, let's do biological control using a predatory mite called Phytoceles persimilis. It's a type 1 predatory mite. And what type 1 means is it only feeds on two-spotted spider mite. And when it runs out of food source, guess what they do? They eat each other, cannibalism, OK? But it's a very effective predator. It's been around since the 1970s. It was one of our first biologicals. And so we decided in 2015, let's do this program. The, the, the former program isn't working. So we ordered some Phytoses for Simulus. This is from a company uh, out there. There are a number of commercial companies you can purchase biologic control agents. And then we released them. This is what the crop has looked like the last six years. We have not seen any spider mites and there's been no spider mite outbreaks like we saw in 2014. We do scout. I go up there and we have some scouting. We do the beet method. Has been absolutely 100% successful. But let me tell you that you got to release the biologicals early. As soon, two weeks after the tomatoes are in the ground, we make releases. And we make about two to three releases early on that carries us over until when the tomatoes are in fruit, then we start dealing with stink bugs. And then by that point, though, spider mites are not an issue and the producer can spray for stink bugs, usually pyrethroids or something that's going to be harmful to the predatory mites. Okay. So this is a cucumber crop that was in a different hoop house that did not get the biological control agents. And you can see the damage caused by two-spotted spider mites. So next year, we're going to use the predatory mites in the hoop houses that have cucumbers. So what are the benefits of this program? It's six years and going. It's less expensive than standard miticide programs, both directly and indirectly. There is an initial cost to the predatory mites, but Phytoseus persimilis has been around so long, it's really in inexpensive. You avoid stimulating problems with other insect or mite pests. We call that secondary pest outbreak. That is, if you spray for spider mites, uh, you may stimulate aphids or a caterpillar outbreak, and then you're forced to spray the rest of the growing season. We have we have had no yield losses with this program compared to previously. Less harmful to workers because there's no residues. The workers can go in there and harvest whenever they want because there are no REIs, then there's no residues to worry about. Also, because we're releasing bumblebees to pollinate the tomatoes, there's no indirect or direct impact on the bumblebees. And we have no issues associated with miticide resistance. If we were, and, and really we were thinking that was a problem in 2014 was the grower was spraying for spider mites. And my theory was he was probably dealing with some resistant populations. With biocontrol, you don't have to worry about that. OK, so what are the key points to consider? You have to aggressively scout your vegetable fruit crops early on. You have to identify the insert or my pest correctly in order to determine what materials to use. You want to determine the extent of potential damage, including spatial distribution and temporal distribution. Again, this is related to seasonality of population dynamics, plant growth stage, you know, early, mid, or in fruit uh, vegetable production. Select the appropriate plant production strategies. And that was my goal was none of these are 100%. But it, you can use a combination of these to minimize in, infestations of these insect and mite pests and minimize potential yield losses. Be sure to keep detailed records to documentation, not only pests, but some of the natural enemies that are out there. And then contact your state extension entomologist if need be. OK? So. There are some publications now. South Dakota is not part of this, but there are states in your area like Minnesota that are. And so we have the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and the Midwest Food Production Guide that you can refer to for materials. Uh, we, we revise these every year. Uh, generally, they're hard copies except for this year because of the situation with the SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, but it is available, it will be available uh, as a PDF in 2021. And these provide information about what insecticides are registered for specific crops. We talked about biocontrol. Uh, also, hoop houses are in there. So if you don't get these, uh, you might want to get uh, part, use them as part of your resource arsenal. Well, our 16th president was a very astute gentleman when he said, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. And yes, the internet is a source of contamination. So I just want to bring that to the forefront. I'm sure many of us are aware of that. Um, but again, it's good to reiterate it. So that's all I have for you uh, this evening. I hope you enjoy this. I appreciate your participation. And with that, I would be happy to address any questions. If you do have any questions, uh, my contact information was on the first image and I have sent it as a PDF uh, if you want to get the actual presentation. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Robin. Thank you, Dr. Cloyd. Um, we had a few questions come in on the chat and if anybody has questions they would like to ask at this point, uh, type them into the chat. Uh, one of the first ones was, what do we use to get rid of aphids? And this is a grower who would probably be looking at organic options. Okay, that's a very good question. Now, if you're NLP certified organic, um, then you're very limited. And the materials you have available are either insecticidal soaps, potassium salts of fatty acids, horticultural oils, which I mentioned, mineral or petroleum based, um, and pyrethrins. Uh, pyrethrins, of course, is the botanical derived from chrysanthemum flowers. So if you are NOP certified, meaning National Organics Program certified organic, then those are the materials really you have available for, for, for aphids. Now, that's outdoor. If you're indoor, I can add one more material, and that would be a product called Mycotrol. Mycotrol is a, is, a, is a fungus material that the active is Bavaria bassiana, and it has activity on aphids, but that's for indoor production, not outdoor production. Thank you. Um, I was curious if there's any difference in the effectiveness of aluminum mulches in a high tunnel versus outdoors. Um, well, it, that really depends on the, the pest complex, but really, um, the, trying to make sure I answer that question re re relevantly. Um, the, the impact on the pest is going to be the same indoor and outdoor. Now, the, the issue might be what pest you're dealing with, outdoor versus indoor. The aluminum mulches are, 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 are going to work on flying insects like white flies, aphids, and um, thrips. Uh, they really don't have activity on beetles or moths that we know at this point. So uh, that's one of the caveats is they're more effective on, we call the sucking soft-bodied insects more so than the uh, hard-bodied insects or the caterpillars, things of that sort. Yeah. Good question. And then we have one that's, that's, uh, shows we're in the western part of the state. Uh, what would be some grassland insects that would have a simple digestive system? Well, that's a good question. Grass, <laughs> uh, you, can you, Rod, I mean, simple digestive system, I'm not sure I understand that, Rada. Do you know what they're talking about or? I am not certain, Lael. Anybody, the person that asked that question, can you uh, elaborate on that? What do you mean by a simple digestive system? Yeah, we may have to follow the, that up uh, um, offline. Yeah, or, um, or you can contact me if you like either. I, run, I, I function on three means of communication, email, um, a landline and cell phone, or I have a dumb phone, so yeah. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on using animals like chickens for pest control? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
uh, one, we have one, several growers that are basically um, organic. They, they call it organic, um, but they actually use chickens uh, to control grasshoppers. They have uh, some cut flowers and some vegetables and uh, they'll release the chickens. Um, of course, the chickens, if they're eating too much, they get really stuffed and satiated and could get sick. But I've had people use chickens for grasshoppers and uh, a little bit of caterpillars. But mostly what I've seen in our region is for grasshoppers. And really, there isn't, there isn't much for grasshoppers. Um, and I've actually seen them out there just you know eating. It takes them a while to eat them because grasshoppers have a very thick cuticle. But uh, that is one way to deal with them. And I'll put on my food safety hat and, and caution that you don't want to have the chickens in the vegetables during the growing season, uh, but releasing them perhaps after you've done your last harvest or uh, putting them around the outside of the plot might be a possibility. Yeah, we've had, we've had people cage them in areas so they can't just meander around uh, the garden. I've, I've seen people uh, have them move the chicken uh, tractor right after they finish a harvest to clean up whatever might be there that wants to overwinter. Is this because of the chicken uh, debris or feces, Rado? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, grasshoppers. Now, um, there is one. I will. I will say this. There is a product called Nolobate or Semaspore. It contains the protozoa uh, Nasema lachesi. Uh, it is just strictly for grasshoppers, but that would mean everybody in South Dakota and Kansas would have to use it because it's, ha it's, it's used on a wide scale basis. Uh, it's not used on a localized basis, but um, it is registered for organic production, but everybody in South Dakota, Minnesota, Kansas, and Nebraska would have to use it. Yeah. Participants, you will probably notice there's a wrap up poem uh, that should have popped up on your screen and we appreciate your taking the time to uh, go ahead and fill that out. Uh, you will also be receiving a follow-up poll or survey later on that's a little bit more uh, in-depth and allows you to write comments but this is a quick way for us to get some some feedback. Um, we appreciate uh, Dr. Cloyd's time tonight um, and he's He's indicated that he's available for, for further questions. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to get him back at some point to talk about some orchard pests and how uh, small scale orchards might might deal with pests. Even community orchards is, is one of our issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so stay tuned about that or contact me if you want further information on that as well. Uh, Coming up at 6.20 tonight, uh, we're having uh, another local food chef demonstration. If you participated last night, it was really fun to, to watch. I didn't try to uh, cook along with, but, but uh, those are also being recorded. So you can go back and, and once you figured out what you're supposed to do, then you can run it over again. Uh, tonight will be... Uh, Chef Kil Kim Tilson Braveheart of Etiquette Catering, uh, cooking with local foods. So uh, that's another uh, separate uh, link, and you will see it popped up now in the chat box. So uh, we welcome you to that, and you're certainly welcome to participate in that also, uh, Dr. Cloyd, if you'd if you're interested. Um, I think I'll have to go home, Rada. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but thank you very much, everybody. And uh, again, if you have any questions, contact me. And I look forward to uh, working with the South Dakota um, growers and, and, and like people like Rada and, and helping you deal with your pest problems. Thank you, everyone. We will see you later on. Thanks. Bye, Rada. <laughs>